Hello everyone and welcome to our channel. Before we get started, please hit the like, subscribe and the bell so you get notified on what is coming up next on Monday, Wednesday and Fridays. Being home alone and waiting to have a friend come over to stay the night is really no big deal. The mystery of the night on April 13th, 1993 and what happened will really, really shock you at the end. This case is Melissa Lee. She was born on February 2nd of 1978. Melissa's mother, Sharon Lee, 34, at that time, describes her daughter as being a sweet, gorgeous, happy, and friendly, a young woman who inspired to being a model, had many friends, and enjoyed working with the elderly. She was a girly girl who liked to dress up and insisted on putting on lipstick and makeup and eyeliner before she ever went out. Now, what just happened to Melissa Lee? Melissa's case takes place in Washington State on April 13, 1993. Sharon Lee had Melissa, age 15, and she had two other children, Eric, 19, and Kelly, 13. Melissa was planning on having a friend over to spend the night Melissa's mother has spoken to her on the phone, a landline phone that they had, and it was around 9.30. She was just checking up on her to make sure she was okay. Her mother did work at as a bartender in a local bar. Now, Melissa was going to have a friend over to spend the night, but not sure why or what happened, why her friend couldn't make it. She never came over. Now, when her mother and her fiance had gotten home, she had noticed the front door open and everything was in disarray. Cushions were thrown around the room. Coffee table was pushed out of its normal place in the living room. She had noticed an ashtray, a jar of peanuts, and a glass of milk had been dumped on the floor. There was a chemical smell that she had smelt in the room as well, and it smelt like ether. All of Melissa's shoes was still in the home. I guess her mother by instinct kicked in and she knew something had bad happened to Melissa. She didn't waste time. She had called the police in the early morning of April 14th. When the police had got there, they did discover Melissa's address book. They did find a pack of Marlboro cigarettes that had not belonged to Melissa. The detectives interviewed over a hundred men and many men were rumored to be a person of interest back in 1993. They gave polygraph tests to four of them, but it appeared to be baseless, said Brad Valvatin, the lead detective on the case. Sadly, a couple did find a body just past 3.30 p.m. in the gulch 100 feet below. They did find Melissa in the ravine on the north side of the Edgewater Creek Bridge in the city limits of Everett, Washington State. She was wearing a black San Jose shark sweatshirt orange and pink shorts and dark socks. They were all disheveled. She wore socks, but no shoes. It appeared she had been sexually assaulted. Her underwear were on her backwards. There was a stain which was noted as evidence. She had died a horrible death from what the Shenomath County Chief Medical Examiner, the autopsy determined she died of asphyxia due to manual strangulation and was classified as a homicide. They did the toxicology report, which found that she did not have any drugs or alcohol in her system, but she did have ethyl ether and heptane. If you're like me, you're probably asking yourself, what is that? Well, it's a colorless compound with a history of uses as an anesthetic and a deliberating intoxicant, as well as its traces of heptine, a solvent that smells like gasoline. After her murder, a handwritten entry in Melissa's diary, which was dated on March 14, 1993, met Alan on the nightline over the phone. The next day, she had written in it, saying that Alan picked me up and someone else up at 4.15 p.m. We went out to eat, then went home. She just had broken up with a boyfriend. 
I hope to God we get back together, she wrote. It was her last handwritten entry on April 12, 1993. On May 18, 1993, the detective started calling the numbers in her phone address book. A man named Dean was listed under a totally different name. The right side of it, there was a note that said Nightline. What is Nightline? Talk line. It's often used as a connect with strangers. This was one way people back in the 90s had fun. It's like a tender today's time. Snohomish County Sheriff's Detective Greg Retina had met up with Dean at his apartment in Madison Street. A side note, now mind you, it was about three and a half miles from where Melissa's body was found. When asked if he knew Melissa Lee, Dean said, oh yeah, I remember her. Melissa and I had met up. We were just talking through Talkline. He said that he did use a fake name, Mike, when he did call the number. They even met in person for a date or two, but he said that's it. It didn't turn out to anything or anything like sexual. When asked what line of work that he did by the detective Greg Retina, he said he was a Boeing mechanic who worked in the interior shop at the Everett plant. He was an assembler of decorative panels at the campus alongside the airport road. He said he had been on a disability for a few months because of his back injury. The detective noted he was telling the truth about his back when they did actually go and find out that he did have back surgery on May 8, 1993. He did have staples put in his back. Also, they did note that he did have access to many types of chemicals in his line of work too. When told of Melissa's death, he told them he did not know she was even dead. Now understand, Melissa's death was all over the news. He lived only three miles away from where she was found. The girl that he knew and saw a few times winds up dead just miles away. And he didn't hear or see anything about her death? Come on. Anyway, the trauma of losing her daughter, Sharon, had her fiance and her pack up and they moved to Tennessee due to being afraid that whoever killed Melissa would come after the rest of her kids. Her long and painful process of rebuilding her life, faced with seeing her daughter's case quickly fade from the media, disheartened her. Melissa's case and the investigation into her death led to many red herrings, lots of dead ends. Yet early on, clues did point to Dean as a possible suspect, but they did not have any evidence to prove or anything to go on to make an arrest. Now the police not knowing that Dean was accused of sexually abusing a girl that was only 13 years old in Scottsdale, Arizona. It was about eight years prior to Melissa's murder. According to the police report in Arizona, the girl told the officers Dean had bought her alcohol, then gave her marijuana that made her feel so high she believed it might have been laced with something. He told her to take off her clothes and as she did, then she said she fell asleep. When she had woken up, Dean told her, quote, I hope I didn't get you pregnant. Dean admitted to the police in Arizona he had bought her beer for the girl, given her some cannabis to her, and slept in the same bed as her, but denied any kissing or sexual contact at all. I mean, really, what real douchebag. This is a shocker, guys. No charges were filed against him, and he did move out of state no justice for that poor girl at all. In the past, Dean had been arrested for marijuana possession, domestic violence, assault, resisting arrest, failing to obey an officer, contributing the delinquents of a minor. He had no felony convictions, so his DNA was never entered into the federal database of felons. He had no recent felony record at all, meaning his genetic profile was never entered in that federal database. Detectives had called Melissa a good kid and had just a few minor problems with police. And she did have some acquaintances who were gang members. They did call this a senseless homicide. Her mother has always said she did not believe that this was a gang related due to many of them were very upset by her death and had even attended her funeral. A friend of hers named Sarah Hinckley said she was always a little bit jealous of Melissa, that Melissa was very beautiful, 
charismatic, she wanted to be just like her. For as many others, Melissa, she was someone to look up to. Now, Melissa's picture was put on a deck of cards that is distributed to the prison system, hoping that someone might know who could have done this to her. Now, some crimes have been solved with this, but sadly, not for the case of Melissa. Her mother, Sharon, had moved back to Washington a year and a half. She had put up posters, flyers, handwritten, even promising a $10,000 reward to anyone with information that would help her solve her daughter's case. I decided for me to get on with my life. I'm going to have to do something about the past, Sharon said during an interview in 1994. Somebody out there knows what happened. At least one person, the person who did it, knows. Now, the detective put Dean under surveillance. They had tried to get his DNA through a ruse in which three undercover detectives showed up at his doorstep asking if he'd try a new flavors of gum to tell them what he thinks of the flavor. But it was very suspicious to Dean, and he saw right through it when they told him to put the discarded gum in a Dixie cup. Dean asked, quote, You're not here to collect my DNA, right? big fail but they did not give up they waited and waited but he did not leave the house at all but it just took that one time on april 21st 2020 when he went outside for a smoke and he smoked a cigarette and discarded it on the ground the undercover officer picked it up from the street to have it tested at the state's crime lab here is where his identity was confirmed through matches analyzed by Parabon Nanolabs, a DNA technology company located in Virginia. Samples of the DNA that would be uploaded to the public genealogy database, GEDmatch. I know I've spoken about this before in my previous videos. C.C. Moore, a genealogist, had begun looking for relative of the suspect, as she had done dozens of times before in cases. She had built a family tree that would reveal the name of the suspect. As she worked on the DNA case, a name that was very familiar to the detectives working the case popped up. The detectives had put Dean under surveillance at his home. Then, on June 2nd, a test of the stain that was on Melissa's underwear had come back as an apparent match to Dean. It was all in the database. On his discarded cigarette, the DNA profile came back as an apparent match to the semen that was on Melissa's underwear, according to the charges. Later on July 28th, 2020, detective from the Sonomish County Sheriff's Office Crime Unit finally made the arrest. As of 2021, however, Alan Dean, 63, will not be held accountable because he is in a psychiatric hospital. It's an agonizing wait to get to this point as well. Now, Melissa Lee, she was only 15 years old when back in 1993, prosecutors say she was deliberately thrown off of this bridge right here. You can see just how terrifying and just how deep that fall would have been. Now though, instead of heading to prison, Perhaps the man accused of killing her is now heading to a mental hospital. Alan Dean is now at the hospital being evaluated for incompetency. Court appearance, Dean was combative and argumentative. Of course. This is under by the way. Several court appearances later, prosecutors say it became clear that Dean had problems with mental health. A judge had found him incompetent to stand trial and indefinitely commit him to Western State Hospital in Pierce County. As for now, the first degree murder charge against him, well, it has been dismissed without prejudice, according to the court documents. The Daily Herald reports first degree murder charges against Alan Edward Dean were dismissed this week under the civil order, but can be filed again if the judge find him competent to stand trial. In the meantime, the former Boeing mechanic will be held at the Western State Hospital. No justice at all for the family and friends of Lee's. He got away with raping, also drugging one girl, and raping and drugging and murdering another. Where is the justice in all this? I hope he brought some help. Well, this is the end of this case, guys.
tell me the bottom line. Do you think that he really is incompetent and needs to be in the hospital for psychiatric help? Or do you think he got away with murder? As always, tell me what you think, guys, in the comments down below. And make sure to be kind to each other. And until our next case, be safe and have a great weekend. Until Monday, bye! Thank you.